Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to the Weekend Wellness Hour. Very excited to have on Anthony DeNobly today, who <laughs> has amazing background along with his partner who we had on a couple of weeks ago, Kirsten Casey, and they are the founders and directors of the company Nourish. And so Anthony has an amazing background. <laughs> he has so many certifications and I'm very excited for him to share. He's a certified holistic nutritionist, a certified functional blood chemistry analysis. He is a functional microbist. He is a medical marijuana specialist, a certified personal trainer, as well as a pastry chef. I had to actually read that because there's so many certifications and skills that he has. So thank you so much for joining us today, Anthony. You're my pleasure. Very happy to be here. It's a lot to fit on a business card. <laughs> it is. You need a whole page to be able to do this. <laughs> but this is why people come to you though as well, because you have all these different skills and it makes it more comprehensive when you're working with someone. So I can understand that. Now, how did you get into all of this? So please share us because you came from a different background. Yes, yes, I did. Um, my, the majority of my career, I was in technology, just kind of fell into that by accident, I guess. Mm -hmm. seems like a lot of people do, they fall into it by accident. Uh, and I started out just doing some software training and then kind of worked my way up to having a specialty in at law firms because they're highly customized and got an application development and some other things. And you're always doing IT. I mean, even at the house, you know, I'm always doing IT with, you know, just little, little stuff, internet printers, that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, I, I reached a point where I wanted to do something else. I was just doing it for, for, for so long. And I actually jumped ship and started a business and opened up a gym. I know Kirsten says wow. opening a restaurant is not optimal. <laughs> you know, opening a gym, it's it was great. I loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a niche a niche gym. I was actually connected to Nourish, which was pretty interesting. Okay. And um, it just was a bad partnership. So I, mm -hmm. I got out of that and actually started working uh, with 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 Kirsten. Went to school, got some certifications, became board certified in holistic nutrition, and just took a, a real interest in physiology and biochemistry. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I just love lab interpretation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting and it, it gives a lot of information, this blood lab interpretation, because it's been around so long and it's, it's, it's valid and it's international. Um, you know, there's lots of fancy tests today and nothing wrong with them, but a lot of them aren't valid. Okay. So um, I've been working with Nourish now for six years, six okay. wonderful years. And, you know, Kirsten not only is my wife, she's my technically my boss. So it's an interesting dynamic. <laughs> You're a brave man. <laughs> Good for her, keeping you in line, both sides. <laughs> so, so what can we find out about with our blood? What, yeah. what can we find out? Um, well, lots. There's, I just refer to them as biomarkers. Mm -hmm. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of biomarkers and, and it doesn't make sense to run all of them every time, but just okay. depending on what's going on, depending on the diagnosis, which usually you'll run blood to kind of at least help with the diagnosis, which we can mm -hmm. do by the way. So just to full disclosure, I'm mm -hmm. not a doctor. So there's two things that are out of my scope of practice. I can't mm -hmm. diagnose and I can't, mm -hmm. or, or I can't prescribe or unprescribe any, any medication. So mm -hmm. when, you know, when clients come to us, they typically have a diagnosis, most cases, okay. and they usually have some level of, of blood work. But you, what's, what's common that I hear is your blood work is normal. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the way I was trained is different than most allopathic doctors are trained mm -hmm. where the normal, you know, all they do is look at the marker in the normal range. Mm -hmm. And if everything's in the normal range, then, then you're good. But most people don't know that the normal range where that comes from, it's based on, it's based on 95% of our population. So the labs, whether it's quest, whether it's uh, lab core, doesn't mm -hmm. matter. They take 95% of the population. That's where they get the normal range. And then if you're in the two and a half percentile, you're, you know, you have a higher low marker. And mm -hmm. by that time, it's usually disease, you know, right. so, so the ranges that, and I didn't come up with the ranges, but the ranges mm -hmm. that I use that I was trained from, from uh, one of my mentors, who's just an amazing um, naturopath and functional blood chemistry. 
analyst, uh, Dr. Weatherby, his mentors and his research and over time, lots and lots of, of uh, very brilliant uh, practitioners came up with optimal ranges. Okay. So I look at markers, not only compared to optimal range to kind of see what you may be trending towards, but the cool thing is there are patterns that blood work will reveal that suggest there's some dis dysfunction in a certain area. Like for, for example, if I can give an example, the adrenals, mm -hmm. which always seem to come up and you understand this as more as anybody, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just cortisol that that is an adrenal marker or i know there's a salivary test where you can take your saliva throughout the day and get a like a circadian rhythm for your for your cortisol but there's with blood it's not only cortisol it's also cholesterol it's also dhea it's also aldosterone if that's a marker that that uh is is available to you it's also sodium potassium sodium potassium ratio you know all mm -hmm. of these markers you look at all those markers and based on that pattern, that would give a, a good idea if, if the adrenals are dysfunctional. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And so are, is there a specific test that you use to find that out? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm, I work, we work with a lab for okay. functional blood chemistry and mm -hmm. for uh, food sensitivity, which we may come back okay. around to. Right. And they're actually Vibrant America is the name of them. They're very cutting edge. We love working okay. with them. Been working with them for okay. years. They're based out of California, so they let they let their practitioners create custom panels. Okay. So I create a custom panel that is it's extensive, very extensive compared to a lot of the blood work that our clients come to us with. Typically, mm -hmm. clients will come to us with like a CBC that you mentioned earlier, yeah. maybe a lipid panel, maybe a complete mm -hmm. metabolic panel, and maybe one thyroid marker, and, and that's about it. Right. Uh, there's so many more, especially with autoimmune disease, and especially thyroid is, is one of the most common ones that we see. You know, there's, there's 10 thyroid markers to really get an overall, including antibodies, to get a really good overall picture of what's going on with the thyroid. Most practitioners look at one. They look okay. at thyroid stimulating hormone, which ironically yeah. is not even produced by the thyroid itself anyway. Not that it's a bad marker, but you mm -hmm. get what I'm saying. So yeah. it's very basic. You know, they'll run uh, like a, a, a few liver enzymes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we run a little more than that because again, it, there's patterns that, that determine uh, what's all going on overall physiology. Right. And I can imagine it's hard to know, well, for a lay person who's just showing up, you don't know that those tests that your doctor, your primary care doctor ordered for you, lipid, the thyroid, the CBCs, to you, that's a lot. To the general public, that's a lot. And yeah. most people aren't even aware that that only tells a tiny story of your health and your blood work. Mm -hmm. So coming to someone like you, and now you can order these tests correctly, correct? Or does the person have to go back to their primary care physician to order the tests? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we can order any test. Okay. Uh, the, you know, the only thing that we can do that a doctor or naturopath can is, is diagnose and, okay. and have anything to do with, with medication. So yeah, okay. we, can, we can order any, any tests practically. Mm -hmm. Occasionally we'll do Lyme, like there's three standard tests that we run on all our clients, but occasionally we'll do Lyme, occasionally maybe mm -hmm. something a little more intense, just depending on the client, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense. But yeah, but yeah, we, we run our own, run our own labs and, and you're right. It's, <laughs> it's very complex. You know, autoimmune okay. is very complex. Yeah. Uh, looking at just a CBC alone, you know, with all the various red blood cell and white blood cell markers, especially if it has a differential and that's breaking out all the different kind of white blood cells, be like, what the heck does, does this stuff, you know, mean? Mm -hmm. And the internet helps, you know, you can, yeah. you can educate yourself on, on the internet. It, it helps uh, tremendously, but, but you're right. It's, it's a lot of, you know, this, this hurts me to say, but a lot of doctors don't even understand what the labs mean. Yeah. Yeah. We have a, one of our mentors uh, who, who helped create the nutrition class that Kirsten and I went through. He worked at Genova and his entire job was to meet with physicians and help in, in explain what the lab results meant. Wow. 
his whole job. That's incredible. <laughs> and I can understand that if, if you're not dealing with it every day, exactly. you don't really retain all that. And maybe they learned it at one point, but it was yeah. their forefront. And it's great to have people like you who do specialize in it. So when you say functional blood chemistry, what exactly do you mean by functional blood chemistry? I'd go back to where you're able to identify patterns. So, okay. you know, in other words, if, if, if you look at someone's blood work and let's just say glucose is 95, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, most practitioners or, and physicians would, would say that that's because it's in the normal range. You know, they'd right. be totally, totally fine with that. But, you know, in the, looking at it through a functional lens, that's, I, I disagree with that. Okay. Um, on the surface, there's a lot of other factors that, that play in a lot of other markers that, that will play into it. Actually, glucose, you can argue that that's an adrenal marker as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as you know, when, when we're stressed, the, yeah. the body will release um, uh, uh, sugar, glucose, mm -hmm. uh, glycogen into the, mm -hmm. into the blood. And when we're about to go get a needle, you know, especially if it's someone that you're mm -hmm. seeing for the first time, it can be, it can be stressful, yeah. you know? Yeah. So just looking at it through a functional lens, being able to identify patterns, looking at okay. the markers through uh, optimal ranges. And then, you know, th there's even another kind of level to it. It's here, here's the best example I can, I can give is let's, let's talk about iron, like serum mm -hmm. iron. If serum iron is low, the answer is not just give more iron. Yeah. How do you know it's not low because your body is trying to keep it low because there are microbes in the body that love to eat iron and your body's doing that on purpose. Oh. You know, so a lot of things to consider. Okay. It's not just if something is low or high, then give more or less of that thing. Okay. It's, it's why is it low or high? Is there something else that's that's tugging it high or tugging it low um, that's causing, like in this example, iron to be below normal or optimal? And so in that situation, how would you discover if there's microbes? To... That, that would be, yeah, that's a good question. That, that would require um, a, more testing. Okay. So, or, you know, there's, I, I would say more, more testing we, before this, before, before we went live, we talked about, there's a, a mm -hmm. test that we run on our clients called the MOAT, M-O-A-T, mm -hmm. it stands for a yeah. microbial organic acid mm -hmm. test. And essentially it's a test that looks at the gut as far as like dysbiosis goes, if there's a, a excess or overgrowth of uh, candida, yeast, fungus, mm -hmm. mold, uh, clostridia is another marker on there, um, just other general bacteria markers. So, you know, I would, factor that in also, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. What kind, what kind of procedure do you have to go through to have that test? What oh, that's is it a is? urine. Yeah. Urine it's, test. Okay. It's, it's great because, you know, you don't have to go for a blood draw. The, mm -hmm. the lab, it's a different lab we use. We use our great okay. planes. They're out in Kansas. They send you a kit. You, um, you just collect your sample at home, put it in the freezer overnight okay. and, and send it out FedEx the next day. Oh, that's wonderful. And then I know we can also look at some nutrient deficiencies in blood panels. So what are some of the common ones you look for? Are there any other ones? I mean, you mentioned iron can be off, but right. what else, what else is out there? Yeah. Besides, you know, iron also can be, I'll, I'll ask if iron comes back low. Mm -hmm. um, most of our clients are, are, are women, you know, when, when you have your menstrual cycle in relation to when you went for the blood draw, because a high percentage of, of um, low iron can be from heavy menstrual cycles. Other things, mm -hmm. vitamin D, as you probably can imagine. Yeah. Uh, zinc, we see a bunch of, uh, we look directly at magnesium. You know, we see insufficiencies, I would say they're not so much deficiencies. Sometimes vitamin mm -hmm. D, like optimal that I look for is between like 60 and 70. Okay. Sometimes with uh, vitamin D, I'll see, I've seen it at 17 before, Ooh. just like really, really deficient. Okay. You know, when you're below 30, that's more insufficient. Uh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. deficient, but when you're between 30 and, and 60, that's more insufficient. So we see a lot, okay. of, a lot of that. Um, you know, another thing that's kind of interesting, certain nutrients like iron work, require sufficient amount of stomach acid to absorb. 
Calcium <laughs> also re requires sufficient amount of stomach acid um, to be absorbed. So I'd probably say those, those three. Iron, uh, it's more, more often lower than high. Vitamin D is, let's say, half or, or more of our clients. It's on the, the lower side. And zinc. You know, so two of the three nutrients that are recommended to, to help with COVID. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I was thinking the same thing. Real quick on the iron. So if let's say you have micro different microbes in your gut and you come back with a low number on iron or, or another nutrient, do you address do you address the microbe first before you even try supplementing with the, the nutrient that's deficient or insufficient? Yes, yes. So okay. I'm I'm a fan of testing for a specific thing before recommending, mm -hmm. you know, a supplement or some kind of treatment for that okay. particular thing. That just always made more more sense to me yeah. than just saying, oh, you know, your iron's low. Let's let's give you iron, or your vitamin D is low. Let's mm -hmm. you know, let's let's give you some some vitamin D. So yeah, I prefer to see the results for the mo test first see what's going on okay. there before moving forward with with you know any additional supplements or treatment mm -hmm. and so if you do have a micro what does it look like for treatment is it a supplement is it something that you need to take out of your diet or both or yeah it's it's, it's a good question um so depending on the person because mm -hmm. typically supplements for infections the supplements for infections are our go-to again we can't prescribe and you know every medication has yeah. has some kind of a side effect or whatever we can't prescribe but very rarely there will be a instance and i'll explain why where i recommend the client goes to their doctor to get a particular medication because that if that if a client just does not tolerate supplements at all mm -hmm. then then giving them, you know, putting them on a, for example, candida would be, we would do something like grapefruit seed extract and something called caprylic acid okay. to help kill off the, the excess growth. Mm -hmm. um, but if someone doesn't tolerate those, or some people just don't tolerate supplements well at all, in that case, I would recommend, you know, visiting with their, with their doctor to get some, okay. some kind of a, a, an antibiotic or whatever. Uh, for overgrowth of, of bacteria, you know, or antifungal for something like, like uh, candida or um, an overgrowth of fungus. Okay. So all this information that we're learning about in the blood, these are real things that happen to people and it can be one of the components of autoimmune disorders, correct? Correct. There's, there's, Antibody markers directly, like for, for thyroid, there's two mm -hmm. antibodies that we can look at, um, TPO and um, thyroglobulin, I think it is, that you can look directly at to see if there's an increase in antibodies. Mm -hmm. um, there are also other markers that, that can suggest, you know, it's, since it's not a direct autoimmune marker, it can suggest a autoimmune um, process like low triglycerides and high okay. HDL, that pattern mm -hmm. suggests there's some kind of an autoimmune process going on. Oh, interesting. And that's separate from someone who's working out all the time, who right. have a high DHDL. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, it's most correct, you know, correct. But you, you look at, you know, you look at all, all the factors, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. HDL, um, you know, and then HDL and cholesterol usually follow one another. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's, right. it's, it's, it's an interesting comment that you make, but I follow you. <laughs> I only know that for personal reasons. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when we're looking at this with the blood work and we're going through the science as the component, one of the components for autoimmune disease, when you're, when someone comes to you, what are some of the symptoms? What do they look like in terms of, okay, are they bloated? What are just, how do they show up? Yeah, good, good question. Almost, if it may be everyone, but almost every person that we talk to, because we don't work with everybody, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we know we can't help everybody. Yeah. Uh, but 
we talk to a lot of people we work with few almost everybody always has fatigue okay at the top of the list you know then there's things like you know you mentioned bloating there's digestive issues there there may be um since we see a lot of thyroid now we have foggy brain inability to mm -hmm. form uh thoughts and finish sentences hair loss um we see skin issues we see um you know things like anxiety and depression you know and i and i get it you know you're you're sick for 10 15 20 years you're going to the doctors for the this doctor, that doctor, that doctor, nobody has any answers for you. They want to give you a, a antidepressant because it's all in your head. How yeah. can you not be depressed or how can you not be anxious? You know, am yeah. I ever going to be back to myself? Am I ever going to get my purpose back? Am I ever going to get my identity back? So I, I get it. But those are just some, some classic symptoms that, that we see. Well, and the other thing that's scary too is as we're talking offline, autoimmune diseases are correlated with different other conditions and there's there's so many interactions yeah you're right uh, that was a great tie-in yeah. uh, so let me let me thank you for that let me share my screen with you so what i'm about to show you i know we have, there's a few people that are just listening in so i'll mm -hmm. do the best i can to explain but i'm going to share my screen with you and show you something that just blew me away when i first um when i first found uh, found it it's essentially it's a it's a correlation between diseases, not necessarily mm -hmm. all autoimmune diseases, but there's several autoimmune diseases um, in, this, in this diagram. And um, yeah, it just shows the correlation between them. So let mm -hmm. me pull that up and just try and verbally explain the best I can. And let me know yeah. if I do a poor job, Amy. No worries. Let me know you can see that. Yes, we can. So what I'm looking at is the best way I can explain it is like a pinwheel. Mm -hmm. And around the outside are all various diseases. This diagram is titled Genesis of Comorbidities. Uh, I didn't create it. I, I, I found it just in my, my research. And it's showing the statistical relationship between one disease and another. So around the outside of the pinwheel are all various autoimmune diseases, as well as other things just like obesity or uh, depression, anxiety. But it, there's so many, you know, you can't really follow all the lines, but a classic example is when I met Kirsten shortly after we met, she was diag diagnosed with celiac disease. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but celiac yep. disease. And if you connect the line right here, it connects to thyroiditis, which essentially is Hashimoto's. And those were the two autoimmune diseases that she, that she mm -hmm. had, you know, she longer, no longer comes up for, for antibodies for either of those. So she was able to heal herself um, yeah. after, yeah, after, you know, a long, uh, a long journey. Mm -hmm. It was interesting going through that, that journey with her. Um, but, but yeah, I just found this pretty mind blowing and, and up on the top, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know it's kind of a long reference, but if you, if you Google that there's, there's a PDF, I don't know exactly where it shows up on the hit list, but there's a PDF that pulls up a multiple page report that oh. goes along with this with this chart but this this is in there I, I love this so much I have it printed out up on my up on my wall just because it's it's just yeah. amazing it's done really well and yeah. you can track like let's say pick um let's see Alzheimer's and dementia and it goes it looks like all the way to depression there's a correlation but mm -hmm. then yep. there's a it correlates to OCD so this includes um, mental disorders as well as neurological disorders as well as um, arthritic disorders and autoimmune I mean mm -hmm. it covers everything so I really recommend people taking a look at this not not to diagnose yourself or to say that you know everything is depending on another but it gives you something to think about and especially when you're looking at your health and you're kind of falling into a pattern of maybe you're pre-diabetic well okay well, look and see what other things are correlated with diabetes and say okay do i really want to go there time to time to contact anthony and kirsten and change your health and look at the nutrition look at your blood work to change things you know and, and what's interesting that you're that you're saying is at the time of this conversation there's almost 200 autoimmune diseases but i frankly i believe in the future everything's going to be autoimmune yeah. so the word autoimmune is just going to fall out and everything because i believe 
when uh, Kirsten was on, they reclassified diabetes and all heart conditions now as, as autoimmune. Wow, that's Am incredible. I Should I kill this? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So then there's another term and you're, you have certifications in this as well. So epigenetics, can you go into that? Because I think that ties into what we're talking about as we're mm -hmm. talking about different diseases. Yeah, I lo love the question. So it's a, it's a relatively new science. And, you know, before we went live, you know, I was mentioning it's, it's a um, challenging, frustrating, but exciting time to be a practitioner. And, you know, with epigenetics, it's, it's super exciting. So relatively new science, essentially in the short of it, it, it's, it's saying that we are not destined to our genes. We are not victims of our, of our genes. We can through environment, through the way we think, through feelings, emotions, we can actually kind of have certain genes express and certain genes um, not express, you know, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. And there's lots of, of, uh, of, of research out there on it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's super, super cool. And, you know, just, just realizing that, that, you know, if, if there's identical twins, this is a good example, identical mm -hmm. twins, same exact genome, right? Why, when they, when, as they grow, maybe 30, 40, 50 years old, they're completely look different, have different career, you know, they're, they're one may be very sick, one may be very, very mm -hmm. healthy, well, why is that if they have exactly the same genome? Mm -hmm. You know, well, it's the decisions that they make during that time. It's the 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 the, the, the environment, the lifestyle, the this you know the thoughts and feelings and emotions that they mm -hmm. that they have that cause certain genes to, you know, to express. And then when those genes express, uh, actually, when we have certain feelings and emotions, they there's a chemical release in the body which triggers certain genes to express. Mm -hmm. Then when the genes express, you know, essentially the, that, that job of the gene expressing is to make proteins. And those proteins is really what determines whether there's gonna be disease or health. You know, there's a particular protein that, that the body makes to suppress um, tumors, you know, and if, if we're living in, in fear and doubt and constant stress, um, those particular particular genes may not express to suppress that particular, uh, you know, cancer causing element. Yeah. And it's true to look at all these different factors, which is great for going to someone who considers all of them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I hear people will go to a doctor for one issue and the doctor is talking to them about other lifestyle changes. And sometimes we hear that very often, we just kind of poo poo it and don't really consider it. But there is some true value and wisdom in anyone who talks about lifestyle changes, because as you said, it affects the way your genes are expressed, which is going to affect your health and how you feel and then how you perform in your life. Exactly. Exactly. You know, we can't, you know, we can't change our genes, but we can influence certain genes to express, mm -hmm. you know, or, or not express. So okay. yeah, it's real, it's real exciting. And, um, you know, I'm more of the science guy, uh, mm -hmm. as far as, as my job in the company, Kirsten's more of the, the emotional traumas and, and, and stress and stuff. But what's, what's interesting, you know, over the years, what I've noticed is mm -hmm. the biggest dividends are always paid by doing the emotional work. You can have the perfect diet and you can be right on and have it all dialed in. Uh, not that you won't get results, but you get much better results when you, when you have the, when you do the emotional work, because we all have stuff you know, that we've, we've uh, uh, got over the years. Um, you know, we all have uh, emotions and, mm -hmm. and things that we, that we have over the years. Um, so yeah, it's the emotional work that's, yeah. that pays the biggest dividends. Yeah, so that kind of ties into what I was going to ask was, how can we prevent ending up in this cascade of health issues? So obviously dealing with our emotions, but also are there certain food, diet, movement tips that you really stress that you, when you were working with people, you kind of see a little bit of a common pattern that you can just get people just a little bit of tips to get them on the right track? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I'm probably going to speak for everybody on this call, for you and myself, and even a lot of cli potential clients that I talk to, 
by the time they come to us, you know, they're, they're not eating at Jack in the box. You know, they, they have a handle on, on um, at least a clue on what they, what they should be eating. Mm -hmm. And the first, there's only two foods that we feel that nobody should eat. And there's research backing this up. There was a doctor that did, and those foods are gluten and dairy. There's a doctor that did a study, it's very interesting, that did a study, I can give you the reference if you want. He looked at four different groups of people. He looked at celiac, which essentially, if you don't know what that is, um, celiac is a, when, when celiacs eat gluten, there's a part of your intestine called the villi and microvilli. Essentially, it looks like shed carpet. Mm -hmm. And the gluten causes an immune response where the immune system eats off or kills off the, the, the villi and microvilli, the shags. So it really uh, lowers the surface area for absorption in the gut. That's why so many celiacs are nutrient deficient because they just don't have the, the absorption. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, with, with gluten and dairy. So the study was on celiacs, current celiacs, recovered celiacs, people with a gluten sensitivity and healthy people, like a group of people with, with none of that. Mm -hmm. And the during the study, they gave them gluten and then they, they looked at their, at their guts. And in 100% of the population, everybody got some level of leaky gut, whether it was chronic or, or acute, they got some level of leaky gut. So in all of us, in every human being, mm -hmm. gluten causes some level of leaky gut. And there, some of the reason is that is with over the years with all the cross pollination and cross breeding and, and, you know, and it could be gluten in conjunction with pesticides. I mean, we don't know, right. there's a lot of things we don't yeah. know, but um, you know, gluten over time used to have eight chromosomes. Now it has as many as 64 chromosomes and our bodies don't recognize it as food. So okay. your body, it causes, it's an irritant. It, it causes irritation to the body. The immune system thinks it's no different than an antigen. So it causes um, a, a, an immune response. Got it. Wow. Uh, so gluten and, and dairy, and here, here, here's, the, here's where it gets fun. There's a term called molecular mimicry. I'm not sure if you ever okay. heard of it. Mm -mm. So molecular mimicry essentially is if you look at a gluten protein under a microscope, proteins mm -hmm. essentially look like pearl necklaces that are folded up in all these patterns. Mm -hmm. And then when you eat food that when you eat, when you eat proteins, because it's proteins and everything, um, I'm vegan, by the way. So, you know, yeah. I get plenty of protein just by eating a variety of foods. Mm -hmm. When, when you eat, protein, the stomach acid hits it, it unfolds those folded up proteins. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like a pearl necklace, mm -hmm. if you will, which essentially are just amino acids connected by these little peptide bonds. Yeah. Uh, molecular mimicry is the sequence of that amino acid is close enough to the sequence of something else where the body gets confused. Okay. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing even with, with, um, you know, the, 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 the spike proteins from COVID, mm -hmm. there's molecular mimicry going on because the amino acid sequence of the spike proteins is close enough to heart tissue, to um, uh, reproductive tissue, and the body's confusing one for the next. But okay. with gluten and dairy, the amino acid sequence for gluten is very close to the amino acid sequence for dairy, close enough where the body can get one confused for the other, Meaning if you eat dairy, you can have the same response as you do if you eat gluten. Does that make oh, that's sense? That's interesting. Yeah, that does make sense. Wow. And then there's another food called inulin, which mm -hmm. you'll see it in some pre in, in, in some probiotics. It's a prebiotic, but I also mm -hmm. see it in energy bars. That's close to gluten. And the frustrating part is we, meaning science, doesn't know everything that has molecular mimicry for something else. Nobody's right. gonna, I mean, no pharmaceutical company is gonna invest the money. There's no return in it for them. They're not gonna invest the money to find all the foods that, that you know, have the molecular mimicry to other foods. Uh, so that's the frustrating part, but there's a few that we do know, like, like gluten dairy and um, gluten and inulin. Okay. And then I have a question related to that. So if 
So those are certain foods that we say, okay, try not to have it because of the inflammatory response. But then some people have some sensitivities Mm -hmm. and you get a test done and then all of a sudden, okay, it comes back and you say, okay, I can't eat strawberries or I can't eat almonds. How long can you not eat that? Or is that forever? Yeah, it's it's a great question. So when, when I meet with a client and we go over their food sensitivity test, I make sure they understand three things. I make sure they understand the difference between a true allergy, they mm-hmm. understand what a sensitivity is, and they understand what an intolerance is because they're, they're different. Um, the best analogy I can give for a food allergy, if you ever saw the movie Hitch with Will Smith, that's an allergy. You know, mm-hmm. he eats shellfish and boom, you have an almost yes. immediate response, very severe Uh, life-threatening in some cases. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's an immune response. There's an inflammatory response. That's an IgE response if you look at the antibody. But what's interesting about it is a IgE response, and I'm going to give you a long answer to that question. The IgE response, the half-life of an IgE antibody is only a few days. So it's severe, but it's short. Okay. Sensitivities there's an immune response and there's an inflammatory response. It's not as severe. I mean, you're not going to the hospital with with, uh, uh, a sensitivity, which is an IgG response, even an IgA response, arguably. But the half-life of an IgG antibody is about 21 to 28 days. Okay. So much longer. So if you think about, you know, if you like math, When a immune cell starts shooting out antibodies, it shoots them out at a rate of 5,000 per second. So think of that over 21 to 28 days. It's a lot of antibodies. There's just going to be collateral damage from the sheer amount of antibodies that that these um, uh, immune cells are are creating. Okay. Um, And then there's intolerances, which the classic one is is dairy intolerance. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, someone's not breaking down the sugar in, in the dairy and, you know, they get gas bloating, but it's not necessarily an immune response. It's just more mm-hmm. uncomfortableness. Um, it's the proteins in the foods that cause the response. Okay. Um, so how long, you know, many clients that have foods, had food sensitivities, ran from other practitioners, they'll essentially say, cut out these foods for three, four months, and then that's Mm -hmm. it. Where they drop the ball is, if you think about why those foods are coming up anyway, okay, they're coming up, yeah, yeah, they're coming up because there's some level of leaky gut. Well, just cutting out the foods isn't enough, you have to heal the gut. Mm -hmm. You have to heal the gut even before you consider reintroducing those foods or else you're going to cut them out and then you reintroduce them, they're going to come back again. Mm-hmm. right or you cut them out you lean into some something else pretty heavy and then all that stuff comes up the next time you retest so it's not a, a uh, an absolute you know it's going to take exactly this long to um, cut them out before you can reintroduce them we have a process that we use what we go by more than the length of time that you cut them out is we go by when you're physically mentally and emotionally ready to reintroduce those foods okay um, you know, most of, most of our clients will retest also just to kind of see where they're at. But yeah, you know, there's healing the gut is is where I find uh, um, the ball is dropped with with practitioners because uh, it's more than just eliminating those foods. So I wish I had a you know a better you know this length of time, but I don't I don't have that. Yeah, and no, it's good because everyone's different, and you don't want to be a uh, you know a textbook. You want to know what's right for your body. And the more you can feel the change in your body and feel your body shift so that you're ready, then you're more aware if something were to come up in the future, you know, when you feel off. So I completely agree and full heartedly promote stuff like that, because we don't want to just be said, okay, six months, and now you can try it. You you don't know where you're going to be at that point. Exactly. And then there there are times, you know, where People just don't get their sensitivities back. Okay. You know, we, we must have ran, you know, upwards of a thousand food sensitivity tests and only one time someone came back with none. Wow. I'm like, 
I thought they may have been on like a uh, immune suppressant because that will impact the results. Mm -hmm. But it was it was a younger it was a younger girl, but I was mm -hmm. still blown away. That's awesome. Well, at least it's out there. There are people out there who can eat other stuff. So this has been great information. How can people reach you if they want to work with you, have more questions for you? Yeah, yeah. We actually, starting Tuesday, we have a five-day uh, challenge. Okay. Uh, Rewire Your Soul Challenge, where we're calling it. It doesn't cost anything. Okay. Um, it's about an hour ish and maybe up to two just depending mm -hmm. on questions and and how you know talkative we, yeah. we get but um the website for that is nourish 123 challenge.com okay you could just register there uh our website if you want to just kind of get a little more information about us what we mm -hmm. do is nourish 123.com so nourish 123 okay. challenge.com for the challenge and nourish 123.com just to check us out a little bit more Makes That's sense. Wonderful. Absolutely. And any last minute advice that we can give to our audience, what they should think, do? Yeah. I mean, I, I always tell people to do, do your research, always do your okay. research on, you know, whether it's anything we talked about today or whatever, just don't go with the flow or, okay. or do it because, um, you know, you're, 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 you're told to. Mm -hmm. um, I always recommend doing, even with, with, with our clients, you know, they're, they're paying us for expertise. I always give mm -hmm. suggestions and recommendations. I never tell anybody to do anything, but it, I recommend doing, doing your own research on stuff. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time on the Saturday. You're welcome. Glad thank to be you. here. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you next weekend. Take care.